بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad before we speak about the most transformative moment in the life of the Prophet which is the incident that took place in the cave of Hira during one of the nights when the Prophet was meditating, I think it's important for us to reflect a little bit about the stages in the Prophet's development. Because everything that has happened in the life of the Prophet has essentially been a preparation for him to undertake this weighty message. The Prophet ﷺ, as we discussed, he was born into a state of tribulation. He was born as an orphan. He faced great hardships from childhood. He loses his mother, his beloved grandfather, after he gets married, he loses his first son. He loses another child. So the Prophet's entire life is characterized by loss, by tribulation, by pain. The Prophet ﷺ, throughout his life, he experiences the pain of isolation. So before we, in order for us to really appreciate what happens to the Prophet at the age of 40? We have to understand the different stages in his development, especially from a spiritual lens. Now, from childhood, the Prophet ﷺ, according to traditions, was spoken to by angels. He was muhaddath. And muhaddath is a term that refers to someone who hears angels. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, in Nahjul Balagha in Sermon 192, and we've already referenced this excerpt, but as a reminder, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says about the Prophet's childhood, وَلَقَدْ قَرَنَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِهِ مِنْ لَدٌ كَانَ فَطِيمًا أَعْظَمَ مَلَكٍ مِنْ مَلَائِكَتِهِ from the time he was weaned, meaning the Prophet, God sent the greatest of his angels to accompany him. This angel who was sent to the Prophet from, from his infancy, from the time that he was weaned, Allah sent an angel to accompany him and lead him day and night, down a path to nobility and virtue. يَسْلُكُوا بِهِ طَرِيقَ الْمَكَارِمِ وَمَحَاسِنَ أَخْلَاقَ الْعَالَمِ لَيْلَهُ وَنَهَارَ Now, of course, every human being is accompanied by angels who protect them, who record their deeds. But this is a special type of care that is given to the Prophet. So from the time that he was weaned, he was accompanied by the greatest of God's angels to train him and to guide him towards the path of nobility and virtue. Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili, the famous Sunni scholar who wrote a commentary of Nahj al-Balagha, in volume 13, page 207, he cites a narration from Imam al-Baqir And again, this shows us that the Prophet, from a very young age, he, he was exposed to the metaphysical realms. The angelic world was gradually revealing itself to him. Imam al-Baqir he says, وَكَّلَ بِمُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وآله ملكا عظيما منذ فصل عن الرضاع 
Imam al-Baqir, he says, God entrusted Muhammad وآله, to a great angel from the time he was weaned. So this is exactly what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib mentions in Nahjul Balagha. يُرْشِدُهُ إِلَى الْخَيْرَاتِ وَمَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ This angel guided the Prophet. You know, this could be angelic inspiration, angelic whispers into his heart. So this angel, from the time he was weaned, was entrusted to the Prophet to guide him to righteousness and to the highest character. وَيَصُدُّهُ عَنَ الشَّرِّ and this angel would divert him from evil and from base character. This angel It was this angel who used to call out to him when he was a young boy, when he was a child. When he was a youth, this angel would speak to him. Of course, the Prophet wasn't able to see the angel, but he would hear this angelic voice saying to him, Peace be upon you, O Muhammad, O Messenger of God. While he was yet a youngster, Imam al Baqir says, when he was a youth, he would hear angels. When he was a youngster, not having attained to the station of messengerhood. فَيَظُنُّ أَنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنَ الْحَجَرْ وَالْأَرْضِ فَيَتَأَمَّلَ فَلَا يَرَى شَيْئًا When the Prophet was a youth, angels would speak to him. He would hear the salutations of angels. And Imam al-Baqir, he says, he would think the sound came from a stone or from somewhere. So he would look around, but see nothing. So in this stage, in the Prophet's development, he is muhaddath. He hears angels. You see, the metaphysical world is gradually pulling back its layers. It's revealing itself to him. You see, spirituality, my dear brothers and sisters, is not like a light switch. The Prophet is growing as a human being. And this is a, a, a misconception that some of us have. We have this impression that the Prophet is born and he already occupies these elevated uh, stations of spirituality. Now, of course, the Prophet was infallible from birth. But the Prophet is growing and is maturing. And you see this in this spiritual development specifically in the gradual way in which the angelic world is revealing itself to him. So the Prophet, as a youth, he would hear Malaika. He would hear the angels speaking to him. And he would look, you know, he and the angels would say it. The angel that accompanied him, for instance, would say, As-salamu alayka ya Muhammad, peace be upon you, O Muhammad, O the Messenger of God. And he, he didn't know where that sound was originating from. He would look at a stone, at a tree, and he would see nothing there. So at this stage in the Prophet's life, he hears angels, but he's not able to see them uh, with his eyes. So that's with respect to uh, his youth. And we also, in our previous episodes, we spoke about uh, the times in which the Prophet would be playing with some of the other Qurashi boys and they would remove their garments, they would remove their shirts and, and they would play and the Prophet would hear a voice telling him that do not remove your clothes. So again, these are Malaika. This is the angel that's accompanying him who is guiding him towards that which is most upright. So... There was no sin that the Prophet was tempted to commit, but rather the angel wants the Prophet, of course, through divine uh, guidance, he wants the Prophet to observe makarim al-akhlaq at every stage in his life, to exhibit the highest uh, moral conduct. So 
the first stage in the prophet's development from the day that he from the time that he was weaned is he begins hearing angels specifically the angel that was entrusted to him by Allah to guide him towards righteousness and impeccable character when he was 37 there's something that changes in him and this is when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa begins to see inspired dreams it is recorded in qasas al anbiya by al qutb al rawandi al qutb al rawandi is one of the prominent shi'i scholars a historian a hadith scholar he writes a book called qasas al anbiya which is one of the oldest uh, books on the prophetic stories he mentions the following he says anna nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ali lamma ata lahu sab lamma ata lahu sab'un wa thalathuna sana kana yara fi nawmih when the prophet reached 37 years when he was 37 years old he used to see the following dream while he slept كأن آتيا أتاه. It was as though someone was approaching him while he was in the mountains herding Abu Talib's goats. كأن آتيا أتاه فيقول يا رسول الله وكان بين الجبال يرعي غنما فنظر إلى شخص يقول له يا رسول الله. So in the dream, the Prophet sees himself herding the goats of Abu Talib and someone addresses him in his dream saying O messenger of God so the prophet in the dream he asks the person men ant who are you who is addressing me as the messenger of God qala ana jibra ana jibrail أَرْسَلَنِ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكَ لِيَتَّخِذَكَ رَسُولًا وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ يَكْتُمُ ذَلِكَ The reply came back to him in the dream that I am Gabriel, I am Jibra'il. God has sent me to you because he wants you, he wants to make you a messenger. And the messenger of God would conceal this from people. So here, you see a progression. The Prophet, from childhood, throughout his youth, he would hear angels. He would hear malaika. But he would not. He, he was not able to see them. He, he couldn't see them while he was awake, nor was he having visions in his dreams. At the age of 37, Jibra, uh, the Prophet ﷺ sees Jibra'il in his dreams. And Jibra'il essentially tells him that you are being groomed for messengerhood. Now at the age of 37, the Prophet doesn't wake up and announce to the people. He doesn't share this with anyone really. He doesn't publicize this. He conceals it from the people. This is mentioned by Al-Qutb al-Rawandi in his Qasas. And the narration continues. فَأَنزَلَ جَبْرَائِيلِ بِمَاءٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ So again, there's a continuation of this dream that the Prophet sees at the, at the age of 37. Then Gabriel brought water from heaven, from the higher realms. And told him, فَقَالَ يَا مُحَمَّدْ قُمْ فَتَوَضَّ O Muhammad, stand and perform wudu. فَعَلَّمَهُ جَبْرَائِيلَ الْوُضُوء عَلَى الْوَجْهِ وَالْيَدَيْنِ مِنَ الْمِرْفَقِ وَمَسْحَ الرَّأْسِ وَالْرِجْلَيْنِ إِلَى الْكَعْبَيْنِ Then Jibra'il taught him the wudu by washing on his face and his arms from the elbows and wiping his head and two feet up to the ankles. وَعَلَّمَهُ الرُّكُوعُ والسجود. And Jibra'il teaches the Prophet sujood and the ruku'. 
So there is some form of the prayer. Now, this is not the Islamic prayer that is legislated after the Prophet begins his risala. This is a special sort of prayer and a wudu and prayer that is taught to the Prophet at the age of 37 that seems to be comprised of the, the basics, namely sujood. Now, during this three-year period, now, of course, it seems that the Prophet would have shared this with Khadija. He would have shared this with Ali ibn Abi Talib, who's essentially being brought up in the, the household of the Prophet. So it seems that from the age of 37 to 40, during this three-year period, the Prophet's prayer consisted only of sujood per the following tradition. And it seemed, and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib explicitly says that he was praying with the Prophet before the age of 40. So Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, he says, and this is recorded by Ibn, Had, Ibn Abi al-Hadid al-Mu'tazili in his sharh, in his commentary of Nahj al-Balagha, Volume 3, page 258. And we have other sources that mention uh, this. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, Sallaytu qabla nas sab'a sinin. I prayed before other people for seven years. Meaning that I prayed with the Prophet for seven years before anyone else prayed with him. We used to do sujood and not ruku'ah. So this is a very you know, primitive form of the prayer. This is the prayer that was performed by Rasulullah, by Ali ibn Abi Talib, presumably by Khadija, and, and some of the very close uh, members of his family before the bi'tha. So when the Prophet, you know, from the age of 37 to 40, when he would go up to the cave of Hira, you know, and if Ali ibn Abi Talib was with him, they would spend time there meditating and they would worship and their salah was not comprised of Quranic recitation because the Quran had not been revealed yet. They essentially prostrate to Allah on the peak of that mountain. So Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I prayed before other people for seven years with the Prophet. And we used to do sujood and not ruku'ah. So you see that the Prophet is acting on the instructions of Jibra'il at the age of 37, but this is all happening through dreams. So the Prophet has not seen Jibra'il in his wakeful state yet. He hears angels, and the only way the Prophet is seeing angels is through these inspired dreams. And then we come to the age of 40. So again, from the time that he was weaned until 37, Rasulullah is muhaddath. He is muhaddath, meaning that he is spoken to by angels. He hears angels but he cannot see them. And we mentioned the narration that says he would hear he would hear angels addressing him as the messenger of God, peace be upon you, O Muhammad, and he would look to see where that sound was coming from and he would not see anyone. And then we come to the third stage in the Prophet's development. And this is when he reaches the age of 40. When, when he was 40, he was appointed as a prophet, but not a messenger. And this is important because many have this assumption that his risala began at the age of 40. The Prophet ﷺ was not yet a rasul in, in the active sense, of course, the potentiality is always there. It's there. But his nubuwa begins 
at 40. So when he, when he was 40, he was appointed as a prophet, but not a messenger to the people. And he's not a message, messenger yet because the message has not been revealed to him yet. Because the Qur'an is the message of God. But at the age of 40, as we'll come to discuss, Qur'an is not yet revealed to him. And this is what happened on the 27th of Rajab in the year 610 Common Era. Now, Shi'i sources are unanimous in naming this date and the age of 40 as the beginning of his nubuwa, as the beginning of his uh, prophethood. And this is based on the tafsir of Imam al-Askari It's a tafsir of the Qur'an that is attributed to our 11th Imam. And he says, فَإِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لَمَّا تَرَكَ التِّجَارَةَ إِلَى الشَّامِ When the Prophet left off trading in Syria. So, you know, this narration indicates that the Prophet from from his days with Abu Talib, throughout his marriage, he wasn't just sitting around, he was working. He was working as a merchant, he was trading in Syria. When the Prophet left off trading in Syria, وَتَصَدَّقَ بِكُلِّ مَا رَزَقَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى مِنْ تِلْكَ التِّجَارَاتِ Now of course, the Prophet and Khadija, they were wealthy. They, they did not need to work to earn a living. But nonetheless, the Prophet still worked and he basically donated all of his income to charity because they didn't need income to survive. But the Prophet ﷺ, because of his love and care for the poor and the, the, uh, the marginalized, he basically gave away all his earnings as charity. So when he decided to give that up, uh, give up the, the trading in Syria. So at the age of 40, he gives up uh, trading in Syria. And he had given all that God had provided him through his business as charity. He used to go to Hira every morning. Now before the age of 40, he would frequent the cave of Hira. But it seems that at the age of 40, he makes it a part of his daily routine. Now that he does, he's not trading as a merchant anymore, he seems to be dedicating more time to his spiritual development. So every morning, he would climb Hira, he would climb Jabal al-Nur, and he would look from its peak at the manifestations of God's mercy. You know, brothers and sisters, it's one thing to think about God in the privacy of your home, to praise Him and glorify Him within the four walls of a room. But it's a very different experience when you praise and you glorify and you worship God with that type of view, when you're gazing upon God's creation. And this is what he would do. You know, the Prophet seemed to yearn for the calm and the stillness of the night. He would gaze up at the stars. He would hear the, the rustling of the, the leaves, he would hear the wind. He was very connected to creation. So he would look from its peak at the manifestations of God's mercy, at the various wonders that Allah had created out of his mercy, and at his, and at his creation's fresh perfection. The Prophet would ponder over the sky, the earth, the sea, and the desert, and derive lessons from these things. And he would worship God as he deserves to be worshipped. The Prophet would devote 
a lot of time to worship and meditation. And on the 27th of Rajab, and you know, we're in the month of Rajab, so the 27th of Rajab marks when the Prophet was at the age of 40, it marks the beginning of his Nubuwa. And this is explicitly what Imam al Sadiq says in Tahdibul Ahkam, which is one of the four most authentic hadith sources in the Shia tradition. It's one of Al Kutub al Arba'a, authored by Shaykh al Tusi. Imam al Sadiq says, La tada' صيام يوم سبع وعشرين من رجب. Do not forsake the fast of the 27th of Rajab. Why? فَإِنَّهُ الْيَوْمُ الَّذِي أُنزِلَتْ فِيهِ النُّبُوَّةُ عَلَى مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وآله. Because it is the day on which prophethood was ordained on Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And even if you look at Sunni sources, if you look at Tariq al-Tabari, he says, Unzila, and you see that there's this distinction that's made between Risala and Nubuwa. In Tariq al-Tabari, volume 2, page 110, in the volume that I have, he says, "Unzilat alayhi nubuwatu wa huwa ibn arba'ina sana." The prophethood, nubuwa, was given to him when he was forty years old. "Faqarna bi nubuwatihi Israfil thalath sinin, fakana yuallimu al kalima wa shay wa lam yanzil al Quran ala lisanih." The Prophet was given to him, the prophethood was given to him when he was 40 years old. At that time, Israfil was assigned to him for three years. He used to teach him various things, but he did not reveal the Quran to him. So when the Prophet was 40, no Quran was being revealed to him. فَلَمَّا مَضَتْ ثَلَاثِ سِنِينَ And this is a common misconception among Sunnis and Shias. It's, it's some, it, this is a narrative that is, has been popularized, but when you look at the sources, it, there's, no, there's nothing to substantiate it. And this, again, is a reminder that just because something is popular, it doesn't mean that it's authentic. You know, رُبَّ مَشْهُورٍ لَا أَصْلَ لَهُ Sometimes that which is popularized, has no basis. So the idea that Qur'an was revealed to, pro- to the Prophet at the age of 40 is actually unfounded in, uh, in Shi'i sources. And even there are some indications in Sunni sources that that's not the case. So the Prophet at the age of 40, he's ordained as a Prophet. Israfil is assigned to him. He teaches him certain things. Again, how this happens, we don't know. But he did not reveal the Qur'an to him. فَلَمَّا مَضَتْ ثَلَاثِ سَنِينَ قَرَنَا بِنُبُوَّتِهِ جِبْرَائِيلِ After three years were over. Jibra'il was assigned to him. فَنَزَلَ الْقُرْآنُ عَلَى لِسَانِهِ So three years after. So at the age of 43, Jibra'il is assigned to him. And he revealed the Qur'an to him for 10 years in Mecca and then and 10 years in Medina. Now, many people say, oh, but I thought the Prophet's mission in, was 13 years Mecca, 10 years in Medina. Yes, he was a prophet at the age of 40. So his nubuwa began at 40 and that's where the misconception is. But he became a Rasul at the age of 43. And at the age of 43, he receives the first ayat of Qur'an. So between the ages of 40 and 43, the Prophet is still making his daily trips to the cave of Hira. So the Qur'an, in fact, 
was revealed over a period of 20 years. The Prophet's Nubuwa lasted for 23 years. But his Risala, he was a Rasul for, for 20 years. But he was a Prophet for 23 years. And, and, and this is where people, they conflate. They assume that because his Nubuwa was 23 years, that means Quran was revealed over 23 years. But that's not true. Quran was revealed to the Prophet when he was 43 and this is exactly what we're seeing in the narrations. Now, the, the narrative that says that Surah Al-Alaq was revealed to the Prophet on the day of the Mab'ath, and in the Sunni tradition, the Mab'ath took place in the month of Ramadan. In the Shi'i tradition, the Mab'ath is, is the 27th of Rajab. 27th of Rajab is when the Prophet is appointed as a Prophet. Now, no reliable Shi'i source says that Surah Al-Alaq or any part of the Qur'an was revealed on the day of the Mab'ath. So to say that on the 27th of Rajab, when the, when the Prophet was 40, he receives the first five verses of Surah Al-Alaq has no basis in Shi'i sources. If, you, if we're going to... If we're going to build a belief system, if we're going to reconstruct the biography of the Prophet, according to the riwayat of Ahlul Bayt, there's no basis for that, for that narrative. So the Prophet, his nubuwa begins at the age of 40. He's ordained as a Prophet on the 27th of Rajab, according to Imam al-Sadiq. But... The Risala, the Quran is not revealed until, until he's 43. Now, it seems that during this three year period, from the age of 40 to 43, there's no Quran that has been revealed. The main activity of Muslims, you know, the Prophet is privately inviting people to Islam, to this new religion. The main activity of Muslims during this three three year period was prayer, not public prayer. It's private prayer. The Prophet is not inviting. He's not publicly inviting anyone. If you look at Tafsir al Qummi, you see an indication of this. And inshallah, in our next episode, we'll do we'll do a comparison. We'll compare and contrast. Shi'i and Sunni reports about what happened uh, during the incident of Hira when the Prophet in fact received the first verses of the Qur'an. We'll leave that inshallah for our next uh, session. So in Tafsir al-Qummi, we read the following uh, tradition. دَخَلَ أَبُوْ طَالِبْ إِلَى النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ وَهُوَ يُصَلِّي وعلي عليه السلام بجنبه. Abu Talib came to the Messenger of God along with Ja'far. So this is during this three-year period. So the Prophet is, uh, this is the first three years before the Prophet publicizes uh, uh, his, before he begins publicly inviting people to Islam. Abu Talib came to the Messenger of God along with Ja'far, his son, the elder brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He observed the messenger with Ali next to him praying. And this is presumably the prayer that was taught to the Prophet by Jibra'il in the dream that he had when he was 37. And this is, you know, the the prayer that, that consists primarily of tasbih and sujood, and, but there's no Qur'an as a part of this prayer. So Abu Talib says, فَقَالَ لَهُ أَبُوْ طَالِبِ فَقَالَ لَهُ وَكَانَ مَعَ أَبِي طَالِبِ جَعْفِرْ فَقَالَ لَهُ أَبُوْ طَالِبِ صِلْ جَنَاحِ بْنِ عَمِّكِ Abu Talib, when he sees the Prophet and Ali praying, he tells his son Ja'far, Go and pray next to your cousin. 
So Ja'far fawaqafa Ja'far ala yasari Rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi فبدر رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله من بينهما فكان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يصلي وعلي وجعفر وزيد وزيد بن حارثة وخديجة يأتمون به أبو طالب سيز رسول الله أن علي praying he tells his son جعفر go and pray next to your cousin so Ja'far stood on the other side. So when Ja'far stood to the left, so it seems that Ali was standing to the right of the Prophet, praying. Ja'far stood to the left. The Prophet steps forward between them both. When Ali, Khadija, and Ja'far had accepted Islam, Zayd ibn Haritha, so Zayd ibn Haritha, who we spoke about in our last episode, the adopted son of the Prophet, he is among the first ones to join the Prophet during this three-year period, before Qur'an is even revealed. They, they participate with the Prophet in his prayer. Therefore, Ali, Ja'far, Zayd, and Khadija would pray behind the Messenger of God. Now, you may have a question about the difference between Nubuwa and Risada. We say that the prophets, that prophethood was ordained when the when Rasulullah was forty. Messengerhood, Risala was ordained upon him when he was forty three. What's the difference between a prophet and a Rasul? In Al Kafi, we find a tradition from Zurara one of the closest companions of Imam al-Baqir and Imam al-Sadiq, عن زرارة قال سألت أبا جعفر زرارة asks Imam al-Baqir عليه السلام عن قول الله عز وجل وكان رسول النبي There are many verses in the Quran where Allah speaks about certain messengers and he says that he was a messenger and a prophet. So زرارة says to Imam al-Baqir ومن نبي مَنْ رَسُولُ وَمَنْ نَبِي What is a messenger and what is a prophet? Is there a difference between the two? Imam al-Baqir, he says, قَالْ النَّبِيُّ الَّذِي يَرَى فِي مَنَامِهِ وَيَسْمَعُ الصَّوْتِ وَلَا يُعَايِنُ الْمَلَكِ Imam al-Baqir, he says, he was... He says, a prophet is one who sees things in his dream and hears the voice but does not see the angel. So it seems that in the, in the dream that the prophet had at the age of 37, it seems that the prophet did not have a... a he was not able to see Jibra'il, but he knew that he was communicating uh, with Jibra'il. So Imam al-Baqir says that a prophet is the one who sees inspired dreams. When he's awake, they hear angels, but they don't see them. But in the dreams, they, uh, they're they able to see angels. And then the Imam says, وَالرَّسُولُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ الصَّوْتِ وَيَرَى فِي الْمَنَامِ وَيُعَايُنُ الْمَلَكِ Whereas the messenger, a Rasul, is one who hears the voice, they hear angels, and they see angels in their dreams and when they are awake. And another narration, I'll just read the, the English for the sake of brevity. Another narration from Al-Ahwal, where he asks Imam Al-Baqir, I asked Abu Ja'far, Imam Al-Baqir about the messenger the Prophet. What's the difference between a messenger and a prophet? The Imam السلام, said, A messenger is one to whom Gabriel comes openly and he sees him and speaks to him. Such a person is a messenger. When they're awake, when they're asleep, they see Jibra'il. They Jibra'il appears to them openly. A prophet is one who sees in his dream 
something like the dream of Abraham or the dream of our prophet. So prophets are able to see angels in their dreams. But when they are awake, they can only hear them. Now, before the coming of Revelation, until Gabriel came from God to inform that him that he was the messenger. So again, this is uh, related to the previous statement. In the case of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, when prophethood was established in him, then Gabriel brought him the message that he was to be a messenger. So when the when Rasulullah was a prophet, he would see Jibra'il in his dreams. And he would be informed of things in his dreams. Some of the prophets in whom prophethood is established, they see in their dreams. The spirit comes to them, the ruh comes to them, speaks and reports to them. But they do not see the spirit when awake. So it seems that the, one of the primary differences between a prophet and a messenger in terms of their ability to interact with angels, a messenger is one who can who hears and sees angels while they are awake or when they're sleeping they have the ability to see them in both states whereas prophets they can hear angels when they are awake but they cannot see them they can only see angels when they are uh, dreaming and this could be you know when you're when you're sleeping the soul is liberated from the limitations of the body. When a person becomes more spiritually refined, they are able to experience that liberation when they're, when they're awake because their souls are stronger and they can interact with the angelic world in a much more direct way, even without being asleep, with their bodies. With while their bodies are still awake. And the Imam then ends by speaking about Muhaddath. Muhaddath is the one who hears angels, but does not openly, he does not see them openly or in his dreams. So a Muhaddath is someone who hears angels, but cannot see angels when they're awake or when they're asleep. A prophet is someone who can see angels when they are dreaming, when they're asleep, but they cannot see angels when they are awake, but they can hear them. Whereas a messenger, a rasul, can hear angels and see them when they are awake and when they are asleep. And with that, uh, we conclude uh, this episode on the life of Prophet Muhammad. Inshallah, in our next episode, will compare and contrast uh, the reports in Sunni and Shia traditions that speak about the first verses that were revealed to the Prophet and how the Prophet responded and reacted to the, the first revelation. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Any questions or comments? Zane, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not sure if you're speaking. Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. No um, yeah, so uh, one question: Do we have any similar stories about the spiritual development of the imams? We don't. No, we don't. We don't have. Uh, now we, we know that the the imams, just like the prophet, their their spirituality increases. In fact. There are narrations that say that every Thursday night, 
the the imams Ali, Ali they receive a type of divine grace that allows them to uh, to increase and develop their uh, their spiritual capacity. But we don't have anything that uh, that gives us kind of a breakdown the way that I've shared with you uh, about the the prophet. But spiritual growth is something that is common between the prophet and the imams of Ahlul Bayt. I mean, there there is no stagnation in their journey towards God. I mean, if you look at the tashahud, even the prophet can go higher and higher. You know, uh, when we say, you know, one of the recommended uh, phrases to recite during the tashahud is, you know, after we recite the tashahud, we say, you know, Allah salli ala Muhammad wa taqabbal shafa'atahu, oh Allah accept his intercession, warfa' darajata. We make a dua to Allah. We ask Allah to raise his station, to raise the status of the Prophet. So this indicates that even the Prophet can get closer and closer to Allah, that even the Prophet can go higher and higher. So when you look at the lives of all of the Imams, you know, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, for example, at the age of 60, is not the same Ali ibn Abi Talib at the age of 30. Of course, the infallibility is consistent, but his ma'rifah of Allah is constantly growing and developing. So the ma'rifah of Ali at the age of 60 is greater than his ma'rifah at the age of 30. Now that's not to say that, you know, of course the isma is consistent, but because God is infinite, you can never say that I am done, I have reached maximum ma'rifah of Allah. There is no created being that can say that I am done getting to know Allah, that I have attained maximum ma'rifah. So because God is infinite, the journey of ma'rifah to Allah is also infinite. And this is one of the the secrets of paradise. You know, people always ask, are we going to get bored in paradise? The answer is, it's impossible to get bored in paradise because one of the the greatest, the highest pleasure of paradise is getting to know God. Right? In, in the same way that, you know, when you're in love with someone, part of the excitement is the getting to know them, period. That in and of itself is pleasurable. Now, so because Allah is infinite, ma'rifatullah is also an endless journey. And hence, the pleasure in paradise is unending. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. How are you doing, Shaykh? Alhamdulillah. You are doing okay. Family is doing okay. Uh, Shaykh, uh, please uh, shed some light on this hadith where the Messenger of Islam says that uh, I was a Nabi even before the creation of Adam and Islam, and Adam and Islam was in between yeah. Ma and Teen. Yeah. So, yeah, please so th this is this is a, a well known hadith, both. Uh, mentioned in Sunni and uh, Shi'i hadith sources where the Prophet says Kuntu nabiyan wa adamu al -ma wa Now this doesn't contradict what we spoke about because the Prophet وآله, he did not come into existence the, the beginning of the Prophet's existence is not when he entered into this physical world. Because all of us, we existed in some form before the creation of this physical world. You know, you can call Alam al Arwah, Alam al Dhar. So we have narrations that mention that in this in this pre uh, in this pre worldly phase in Alam al the Prophet وآله, his soul, his spirit, according to traditions, the, the prophetic light was the first thing that was created. So when the Prophet says, I was a prophet 
كنت نبيا وآدم بين الماء والطين it's referring to to that world to عالم الأرواح the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the first thing that God created the the capacity the potentials are all within within the, that prophetic light but the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in عالم الدنيا his official job as a Nabi, as a, as a Rasul, does not begin from the, the moment of his birth. I mean, this is what clearly Imam... So again, we need to make a distinction between potentiality and actuality. Imam al-Baqir says that on the 27th of Rajab, Nubuwa was established in him. So this is not to say that this is not to contradict the narrations that say that the Rasulullah was a messenger before uh, the creation of uh, of Adam. Wa Adam al ma'i wa This is speaking about the the world that predates Alam al dunya, where you don't have the you know because that world is different in nature from this world. This world is Alam al khalq where things have to go through stages. Alam al-Arwah is the, the, it's the world of Alam al-Amr. It's the, it's the kun fayakun phase. So what, what, is, what exists in that world has to go through stages to manifest itself. Whereas in Alam al-Arwah, things are already, uh, they've, or, they've already actualized. Does that make sense? So when you look at, for example, a a seed, the seed, everything that we see in a tree is contained in the seed. But the seed has to go through stages for it to go from potential to actuality. And the same thing applies to the Prophet Again, this is this is mentioned in many narrations where the the essence of the Prophet and Ali are one. You know, if you want to think of the Prophet and Ali, it's like one soul that inhabits two bodies. Of course, not in a not in a literal sense, but there and this is what the, I mean, the Quran in, in, in Ayatul Mubahala makes this very clear, you know, for the Quran to describe Ali as the nafs of the Prophet. It means that they are created from the same essence, from the same source. There is no one in creation who resembles the Prophet in his spirituality. In his perfection, like Ali ibn Abi Talib, and this is and this is why you see that, uh, and we'll mention this inshallah in our next episode where Amir al Mu'minin alayhi salam, he hears, you know, he himself says that, you know, he was able to hear Jibrail when Jibrail descended upon the Prophet, and really the only the difference, the only difference between. The Prophet and Ali ibn Abi Talib is uh, is Nubuwa. Uh, and of course, and this is what's echoed in uh, in Hadithul Manzila that you know, oh Ali, you are to me as as Aaron was to Musa, except that there is no Prophet after me. And it's it's and, and when the Prophet says, Illa anna la nabiya ba'di, what this indicates is that. The, the job, the duty of Nubuwa ends after me. There's no need for prophethood after me. 
had there been a need for Nubuwa, you would have qualified for Nubuwa. So the only difference between Ali and the Prophet is Nubuwa. And because Nubuwa has ended, this is the only reason why Ali doesn't possess Nubuwa. But Imama continues, and therefore he has the uh, the station of Imama. And we'll we'll shed some more light on this when we speak about uh, the the first revelation. And and, and Amir al muminin he actually shares with us uh, his perspective and what he saw and what he witnessed when revelation descended upon the Prophet. But again, in a nutshell, when when the ahadith tell us that you know the first thing that Allah created was the light of the prophet and from that light uh, that light was divided into two and one was muhammad and the other was ali i mean our minds c- can not even grasp the the magnitude and the immensity of that statement but for our simplistic minds you know suffice it to say that that ali and the prophet they are essentially two sides of the same coin and as the Quran says that you know he's the nafs of the prophet you know there's no there's no it's as if you know when, when you speak about the prophet you're speaking about Ali and when you speak about Ali it's it's as though you're speaking about the prophet you can't have one without the other thank you Shaykh <laughs> There are accounts of the Prophet, people who say that the Prophet used Khadija as well to help uh, out in the early days of Islam. But it sounds like they would they actually gave away all of their wealth. Um, how can the, this conflicting account be explained? Can you repeat the question? Um, th- there are accounts that uh, the Prophet, or people, there are people who say that the Prophet would use Khadija as wealth to help uh, in the early days of Islam. Yes. Uh, and if they had given away all their wealth, then how could that be the case? No, the the hadith the hadith doesn't say that the prophet gave away all of Khadija's wealth. He gave away the the wealth that he was earning from uh, from trading. And Khadija being, I mean, I, you the the implication and the assumption that we can make is that Khadija saw that you know I already have plenty of wealth that I've accumulated. And it seems that she encouraged the Prophet to use that money that he had earned and give it give it away to the poor. She, she never essentially wanted the Prophet to maintain her and use that money to provide for her uh, living expenses because the, the wealth was already there. So it's not that he spent her wealth. He spent his own wealth uh, because Khadija simply did not want him to use that money uh, for her maintenance. And uh, what about that ayah uh, uh, Sheikh? It says, Alam yajadka yatiman fa'awa now, now again, b- before the Prophet married Khadija, his his uh, his economic situation was not very good, you know, because he when he would work, as we mentioned, he was helping. Abu Talib. Abu Talib had a big family, so a lot of his income was going to support Abu Talib. Now, when so Allah enriches him through his marriage with uh, with Khadija. So, so now, so you have the wealth of Khadija combined with the Prophet's own earnings, and the wealth of Khadija suffices for all of their needs, and therefore the Prophet has all of this discretionary, this disposable income now. That he can use, and this is, of course, after uh, you know Abu Talib's situation seems to have improved. The Prophet now has this disposable income, and because Khadija and the Prophet both had shared values, they used that uh, disposable income uh, to spend on uh, the less fortunate. So the Prophet was economically 
disadvantaged before he married Khadija. I mean, there was a lot of pressure on the Prophet to uh, to help uh, Abu Talib. And so, you know, the Prophet was enriched, Allah enriched him through his, uh, his marriage to, uh, with Khadija. Thank you, Sheikh. Ahsan Barakallah Fikum. Thank you so much for for tuning in. And inshallah, next week uh, we will continue our discussion. And alhamdulillah, it's a very uh, appropriate time to speak about you know uh, these uh, this part of the Prophet's life because it happened in the month of Rajab and when but with the month of Ramadan approaching, I think that a lot of these discussions are going to be very uh, appropriate in terms of time.